Tonight, the government admits its plans to axe national insurance won't happen anytime soon and suggests income tax could have to go up as well. Rishi Sunak says he wants to make good progress in the next parliament to achieving his goal because everyone in work at the moment is paying tax twice. As for where yesterday's budget leaves Labour, Keir Starmer says the national insurance plan is an unfunded commitment and is staggering. That is. Also tonight, after Science Minister Michelle Donnellan used taxpayers' money to settle a legal dispute, there are fresh calls for her to pay back the money herself. I'll be speaking about that and reacting to the budget with the Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride and the Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Hay. Plus, ahead of International Women's Day tomorrow, I've sat down with Cherie Blair, who's told me what advice she's passing on from Hillary Clinton to Victoria Starmer. And could we have the makings of an indie supergroup in Parliament after the next general election? We will explain why. All that and more with our panellists Josh Simons and Nick Ferrari, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Thursday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Well, at the beginning of the week, I started Monday's programme by saying that by today, we'd have a much better idea about when the next election would be. And what happened in the budget would give us some important intelligence. If it's the last fiscal event before spring election, we'd expect rabbits jumping out of hats all over the place. But if Rishi Sunak was planning on going long, then he might prioritise economic credibility, leaving a bit of wriggle room to fund a pre-election giveaway. And I promise to let you know my thoughts today. And actually, I feel more confident now than I thought I might do in saying that it didn't feel like a pre-election budget to me. So my gut is now saying autumn and not May for the election. But since the budget, though, something interesting has emerged because last night the Treasury Minister, Bim Afalami, told me the long-term aim of the government was to eliminate national insurance by bringing it down to zero. Eliminate national insurance. It raises 168 billion pounds. That's twice the education budget. You know, closing down every school in the country wouldn't come close to funding it. And look, we haven't seen the details of what the long-term ambition is, how they'd fund it, how long it would take. And the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, now seems to be suggesting they could end up merging national insurance and income tax. Either way, it would be very, very significant and a difficult change to our tax system. It's certainly eye-catching. Could soothe the anxiety of Conservative MPs who want more tax cuts now. Plus, we're used to parties putting unrealistic promises in their manifestos. Reform wants to bring both NHS waiting lists and net migration down to zero. But it is probably worth pointing out that the unrealistic promises are usually only made by parties who know they won't win the election and won't actually have to make them happen. Well, let's take a listen now to how the Prime Minister defended the budget today and what he had to say about this plan to axe national insurance. I believe in a simpler, fairer tax system. And at the moment, we do have something that's overly complex. Everyone in work is paying tax twice, once in income tax, once in national insurance. That's unnecessarily complicated because all that money ultimately goes into the same pot to fund the same public services. But it's also unfair because it's not right that people in work face this double taxation compared to everything else. So my ultimate long-term ambition is to end that unfairness. And if we stick to our plan, we'll be able to make good progress towards that goal in the next parliament. That was Rishi Sunak. We also heard from the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, who took a dim view on the Chancellor's plan to cut national insurance. £46 billion pounds unfunded commitment yesterday from the Chancellor at the end of the budget to abolish national insurance. That's staggering. And in the end, the overall story of the budget was, as ever, government give with one hand and take much more with the other and people have seen 14 years of this they're not going to be taken in by this contract they want an election not change now what do the measures set out in the budget mean for public services and will they make you better or worse off well the institute for fiscal studies a leading think tank today painted a bleak picture for the country's prospects saying that spending on public services will be cut by around 20 billion pounds under the plans. Our economics and data editor Ed Conway has been delving into the numbers and asks if we're facing a new age of austerity. Day two after the budget, we get a sense 
of what this really means for people when we get the analysis from various different think tanks, the post-mortem, as some people might call it. And one of the interesting things that's coming out at the moment is this. Uh, this is from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. They're pointing to the fact that the government says it wants to increase departmental spending in the coming years by 1%, not cutting it. And that looks like it's very generous, uh, but here's the thing. You've got to divide it between different departments. Some departments have guaranteed increases in the coming years, so they're protected departments, things like health, things like defence. But that means there's less money left for everyone else. So unprotected departments, which have already seen about 20% real terms cut, are going to see another cut, 3.5% a year potentially, in the coming years. Some people think maybe a new era of austerity as a result of these spending changes. And when you divide it by head of the population, look at these bars, they go down even further. So big cuts ahead if indeed those plans are going to be kept to, but some people say they may not be. Government and opposition are joining in a conspiracy of silence in not acknowledging the scale of the choices and trade-offs that will face us after the election. They and we could be in for a rude awakening when those choices become unavoidable. So that was uh, Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Another big question they've been looking at is whether you're going to feel better off or worse off as a result of all the different policies we've heard about, not just in the budget, but previously. This was before the budget, and what this is doing is basically showing you whether you're better off, anything above the bar, or lower off by different income groups, from the poorest through to the richest. And you can see before this uh, budget, most people were slightly worse off as a result of the different policies, largely because those income tax thresholds have been frozen, so more people get dragged into paying higher tax. But look at what happens as a result of what we've just heard about. So largely because of those cuts in inc uh, national insurance, you can see those bars go up. You're getting a bit more money. And when you net them off, so just work out the overall increase, because you've got a bit of plus and a bit of minus there, here's what it shows. Actually, all but the richest are slightly better off as a result of these policies this year. But that's the key thing. This year, move forward a few years and look at what happens to this line. It's above the kind of zero point, but then it goes to below the zero point because by 2027 to 28, all but the poorest will be worse off. And that's because more people are going to be dragged into paying higher levels of tax. Now, it's worth just saying right now, you probably maybe don't feel uh, better off. It's partly because the overall economy, so that leaving aside those changes there, the overall economy has really not been doing very well. This is showing you over different parliaments just how much increase there has been in your real household disposable income, the pound in your pocket, essentially. And you can see every parliament going back to the 1950s, it got higher, things got better. But now look at what's happened in this parliament. Really striking there. It's the first time there's been a fall, going back as far as these numbers uh, have existed, underlining there is still so much to be done to try to increase what economists might call the feel-good factor. Well, there was uh, Ed Conway, our economics uh, editor. We can now speak to Mel Stride, uh, who is the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, about yesterday's budget and a bit more. Right, national insurance. What's going on? Is the aim to... Well, it's coming it? down. It's coming down. We know it's dramatic. coming down, but, um, but is the aim to get rid of it? So, well, there's an aspiration, mm -hmm. generally, to bring down national insurance and, indeed, taxes more generally beyond the next election. But that's where we are. It's an aspiration. It's a clear direction of travel. Uh, what we have done on national insurance, of course, is over this fiscal event and the last one, is reduce it such that 27 million people are going to be £900 better off this year Two million self-employed people will be £650 better off this year. So that's a very clear demonstration of the fact that we are going to be bearing down on tax as we move uh, forward. So you say that the long-term aspiration is to bring down taxes. Right. OK, we, we know that. But, but mm. I'm asking you specifically about national insurance, right? Mm. Because there's been an awful lot of speculation about this uh, tax and mm. what is going on. Is a plan to mm. merge it? The long-term plan, I accept. Yeah. Is a plan to merge it with income tax or is it just yeah. to get rid of national insurance? I, I just want to play to you what Bima Falami, uh, Treasury Minister, told me uh, on this yesterday. I right. think you should be able to see it. Um, just to be clear, your long-term aim, and look, this is not something you can do in a year, I get yeah, that. I want your your long-term aim is to bring national insurance all the way down to zero. Yeah, we want to, we to want get, to get we want to We want to eliminate that double tax on work. And this isn't just some ideological thing. It means it can help grow our economy because we'll increase the number of people who are working in our economy, increase the number of hours that they work. So he's saying there very clearly that, yes, the aim is to bring it down to zero and to eliminate it. Is that right? 
Well, my, my understanding, having seen what the Prime Minister said, and I think he's absolutely right, and the Chancellor in his speech, incidentally, was there's a very clear aspiration to bring national insurance down. This will be no, not, the next no, no, Parliament, we, we, it will know, take time. We know you want to bring well, national insurance down. Well, down covers a, a whole variety no, but, of different but I, I, The question endings, there was, but... do you want to bring it down to zero, or do you want to eliminate it? That is well, such a different thing than saying, well, do you want to bring it down? OK, well, so, so I think I'm very clear of where yeah. I think we are, which is that we've made it very clear that the direction of travel that we want to see with taxes, including national insurance, is that it comes down. We do recognise that national that's insurance, not, along not... with income tax, mm -hmm. is two taxes being applied to those people that are in work on that work-based income, and we don't think that's fair, as the PM has made clear, and we have a very clear aspiration to bring the national insurance down through time. But that I is an aspiration and it's something beyond uh, the next general uh, election. It's something that will go into beyond next the uh, next general I, um, yeah. I'm really confused, I'll be honest. I'm more confused now than I was, you know. Do you want to get rid of financial insurance or not? Well, my understanding, Sophie, and all I can tell you is my <laughs> understanding, <laughs> yeah. is that we have an aspiration to get it down. OK, that's the shorthand version that feels quite of what my understanding is. To saying well, you want to eliminate national insurance. So, but, but I think the Prime Minister, had you played the Prime Minister's clip, not Bim Afalami's clip, I think what the Prime Minister said is that we want to see these taxes coming down. There is an inherent unfairness of having both income tax and national insurance being applied to earnings for those that are in work. And we want to see that situation resolved and we want to see those taxes coming down. But it is an aspiration, so you think something Bim, that will go beyond think, the next general election. Do you think Bim Afalami might have got it a bit wrong? Well, uh, Bim will have his view, he's a Treasury Minister, but I'm telling you what my view is, based on what my understanding of what the Prime Minister has said and what the Chancellor said in the Budget yesterday, where I thought they were extremely clear that there's a longer-term aspiration, which will go beyond the next general election, to get those taxes down. And what you've seen in this Budget and in the previous one, previous one is exactly that because if you, happening. If, if you did get rid of national insurance completely, that's quite hard, isn't it? I mean, you know, right, you're the, well, that's why, you're the work and pensions yeah, minister. It's yeah. pensions contributions and stuff like that, right? It doesn't make sense, does it? So, well, there, there's no hypothecation as such from the tax that's raised through national insurance. It just mm. goes into the general public spending pot. Mm. Uh, so it's become a bit of a, a misnomer. So whether you cut that tax or another in those terms, mm doesn't actually have any impact, certainly on pensions, because that's funded through the general... But I guess the, the uh, you know, £168 billion pounds of revenue is, is, is quite a lot to get rid of. I mean, that's what, like, more than double the entire school's budget. You could get rid of every single school yes, the, the, these... and you wouldn't even be yes. halfway there. Yeah, so VAT, uh, income tax and national insurance are the big, broad-based taxes which are bringing very large amounts of money. So if you're going to bear down on those, they do come with a hefty price tag. And that is why... We're talking about an aspiration for the future, something beyond the next general election. We have demonstrated that we can do this. Look, national insurance for employees has been slashed by a third. That's what that 4p reduction on 12p means. It means one third of that has been removed. It's, so um... we can make real progress. Sure. And, and one important point here, Sophie, is this isn't all just about how much money we're saving people. It's about driving more people engaging with the labour mm. market. So what the OBR says is that these two fiscal events, these two drops in tax here, are actually going to mean that the equivalent of 200,000 more people will be in the labour market by the end of the forecast period. And when you've got a tight labour market with a lot of vacancies, that's really important. That's part of the reason why the Chancellor felt it was important to do that. Is there a plan to merge national insurance and income tax? Well, we're not talking about specific plans. We're talking about an aspiration particularly centred around national insurance that will go beyond the next general election to bring these taxes down and what we've demonstrated okay, both well, in we the know, autumn statement and the taxes spring. Down. Well, you, you've made that point. Well, well, well you know we that this is precisely okay. what the, the Prime Minister said and, and with respect, if you played his clip, uh, you would be saying, well, yes, that's perfectly in line with what the Prime Minister has said. OK. Yeah. Um, is it right that taxpayers paid £50,000 to cover damages uh, paid to an academic after the science secretary, Michelle Donnellan, uh, accused her of supporting Hamas? So, my understanding is this money has been paid without uh, admission of liability. It's been paid promptly and early in order to keep the amount that's been paid uh, to the minimum, and I think that's the right thing to do. But look, I think the general principle of where a minister is acting in that capacity 
advised by civil servants on the actions that they're taking, it is right and proper that they have that kind uh, of support behind them. What, so and I think, civil service well, advised her to... Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't know. I'm not quite well, I wasn't in the room when advice from whoever it may or may not have come was being dispensed, so neither you or I know the answer to that question. But I think, as I say, as a matter of principle, I think if somebody is a minister in a department being advised by civil servants and uh, acts in the capacity of a minister, it's right that they have that kind of support. And I think if we were Shouldn't in a, well, if we were in a world in which, well, if we were in a world where that was the case, I think it would be very, very difficult for ministers to go out there, normal business of doing things, but if they were... <laughs> that normal that business had, accusing people oh, well, of supporting well, us. Well, of if they... Well, that, <laughs> that may have been on the basis of advice received. But I don't, we don't, I don't know. know. You don't know. Well, we you don't said know, that and I don't so, know, but I think so this is where... you don't this know is where I, I said it... I did say may. I didn't say was. <laughs> I said may. But e e even whether it was may or was, I think the important thing is, as a matter of principle, if somebody is serving as a minister in a government department acting on, maybe, acting on advice uh, of officials around them, but certainly in the capacity or as a minister, then I think that kind of support is only reasonable. And I don't think we should expect... I mean, look, there's a long precedent here of this. Uh, Tony Blair and uh, the Iraq War and the inquiry around that and all, all of those kind of things were covered by exactly this principle. And I think it's a really important principle to maintain. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good you. to talk to you today. Thank That's you. right there. Well, earlier, Ed Conway spelled out for us uh, what the budget means for spending on public services. Under the Chancellor's plan, spending is being reined in, but many voters oppose the cuts and hope a Labour government might open the purse strings. So are they going to do that? Speaking to the party Shadow Transport Secretary, Louise Hay, before we came on air, I pressed her on whether that hope is well placed. Thank you so much for being on the programme today. We appreciate having you on. We've been talking an awful lot about tax since the budget. Tax cuts that both main parties are signed up to, fantasy tax cuts that you know, may never happen. I want to talk to you about something else, um, spending. Because from April 2025, according to the budget, unprotected public service spending is set to fall by 3% a year. Would a Labour government spend more than that? Well, look, we do not underestimate the scale of the challenge that Labour will be inheriting if we are privileged enough to win the next general election. They have blown hole after hole in the public finances, not least after Liz Truss's disastrous mini-budget last year. Uh, and as you say, although overall public spending is due to rise by 1% in real terms, these unprotected departments do have scheduled cuts coming in. That's why we've set forward specific tax rises in order to inject uh, immediate funding into our very, very overstretched public finances, including closing the VAT uh, relief loophole on private schools in order to invest in teachers uh, and our education system. Um, but it's also why we have said, and Rachel Reeves has been very clear, that if she were delivering that budget yesterday, it would be mercilessly focused on getting growth into the economy again. If the saying. economy had grown at the same level as the OECD average over the last 14 years, it would be £140 billion larger than it is now. I, and that would I, mean we have £50 billion more to spend on public services. That's why I we understand. are relentless on that. Sorry, I, I understand the focus on growth. But you're not going to get growth by April 2025, are you, with the best will in the world? That is basically impossible. And yes, you're talking about VAT on private schools, but that's a couple of billion pounds. Like, I know, don't get me wrong, that's not to be sniffed at. But I just want to look at the scale of the public spending challenge. You know, analysts say these spending plans are impossible to deliver. You know, current government policy implies a real terms cut to net public sector investment of more than 18 billion billion pounds between 2024 and 2025. You know, people are worried about the state of the public services. People think a Labour government is going to change that. Are you going to change that, though? Are you going to spend more money? Well, as I say, that's why we have set out these specific tax rises. And obviously, Jeremy Hunt, after two years of um, trashing the non-DOM uh, tax, uh, um, tax abolition that we've been campaigning for, um, directly stole our policy and a sort of final humiliation of the, this government. Um, so we will be finding 
uh, additional ways, new ways to fund our existing pledges. But look, we recognise that certain public services, public services need an immediate injection of uh, finance because they are on their knees after 14 years of Conservative government. But what Rachel has been consistently clear on is that we will be guided by fiscal responsibility because we know what happens when a government does play fast and loose uh, with public finances. That happened last year after the mini budget that left so many people with uh, people's mortgages so seriously impacted. That's why she's been very clear that she'll be fiscally responsible and nothing that we set out will be unfunded. But look, of course, as we get closer to the election, we will be setting out further, um, further plans about uh, our public finances. There may still yet be another financial um, a statement, another financial um, uh, budget of some description before the election. So we don't yet know what we will be inheriting. At the same time, though, you know, it's at £1.7 billion pounds the VAT uh, tax rise. That's what it's expected to raise. You know, that's it's a drop in the ocean uh, when you're considering £18 billion pounds of real terms cut to public service investment. And we've also set out plans to close loopholes on private interest equity, um, which is currently taxed at, 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 taxed at capital rather than uh, income levels. And as I say, we will be going away and examining line by line uh, the budget that was announced yesterday so that we can finance our specific um, funding pledges that we've made. Um, but as Rachel Rees has set out repeatedly, we will abide by our fiscal rules and we will not be setting out anything that is unfunded. But look, a Labour government will always prioritise public services and we will always want to invest in order to make sure uh, that those public services are delivered in a fair uh, and proper way. The last 14 years have left public services on their knees, record, NHS uh, waiting lists at record high, the criminal justice system uh, in, a, in a practical state of collapse. Uh, we do not underestimate the scale of the challenge uh, of everything that we will inherit, not least with the economy and the perilous state it's in. Uh, but this is the reality of what the Tories have left us and we're set to trying to set out credible plans to make sure that we can invest as quickly as possible in those priority public services and then get the economy growing so that we can recoup money into the public sector and deliver it into the public services. Um, I want to talk to you about Michelle Donnellan, the uh, Secretary of State for Science. Taxpayers uh, paying £15,000 uh, after her false claim about academics supporting Hamas. What, what do you think should happen there? I could honestly not believe my eyes when I read this story. I think it is absolutely appalling that the taxpayer should fund uh, her legal costs after she made such scurrilous claims against an academic and has been forced to pay out. Uh, Rachel Reeves was uh, out this morning saying that there is no way she would bear that if she was Chancellor. And uh, I think you are, you probably agree with me. Uh, that's, that's definitely the case. There's zero way Rachel would have funded those legal costs. And clearly she, she should be covering the costs for them and herself. We'll be trying to get a, a response from the government uh, on this as well, of course. The other question I want to ask you about is that when, you know, whenever I interview a Labour politician, they tell me the election's going to be May, the election's going to be May the 2nd. Do you still think that's the case after the budget? Because I'll be honest, it doesn't feel like it was a pre-election budget to me. Uh, it was pretty lacklustre, wasn't it? Uh, it didn't feel like anything that they could particularly go to the country with, but I think it would be um, pretty disgraceful if they didn't go in May. We're on the 3rd Prime Minister since uh, the last will, general. Do you think they will go in May? Look, your guess is as good as mine. It's difficult uh, for me to put myself in Rishi Sunak's shoes because he keeps coming out and doing increasingly madder and more bizarre things. I, I, I hope for the country's sake that he goes in May because it is absolutely uh, the, you know, time for a change and the public are clearly clamouring for one and we need to have that general election as soon as possible. OK, thank you very much indeed. Louise Hay, good to have you on the show tonight. Right, let's bring in our duo for this evening, shall we? The broadcaster, Nick Ferrari, and the director of the Labour Together think tank, Josh Simons. Great to have you both with us. Good Busy week. Feels like we're kind of limping towards the end of budget week. It's always really, really full on uh, here in Westminster. I'm really confused about national insurance, I'll be honest. Nick, are you... I don't... Well, you started the show by asking where was the rabbit out of Jeremy... Uh, Hunt's uh, hat. Not only did he not have a rabbit, he didn't have a hat. In fact, he had a flat cap. But I think it's now moved on because of your interview. Because, let's be honest, OK, for people like us, we can argue about 2p, 4p and national insurance. If you are actually moving to scrap it, that is an enormous policy. 
But what there seems to be now, as you've exposed with Mel Stride into five or six minutes ago, is there's utter confusion within the higher echelons of where the Conservative Party is. So I do think this speaks to the fact that they are at best a little bit mixed, if a little bit muddled. We have one line from the Prime Minister. We have BIM going a little bit further. We have Mel Stride seeming to row it back. I think, Josh, we probably have Jeremy Hunt actually what the party line is. But if they can't mm. agree that between... This is something that actually the public can really latch onto. Mm. This is desperately simple. They clearly don't have a line to go on. And something like that cuts through all the percentages up, percentages down and everything else. Yeah, I, that's it. I mean, it's different nuances, different emphases, but it is quite confusing because they yeah. are saying yeah. different things, right? And in the end, there's two options. Either they mean it and they want to scrap it, in which case there's £168 billion of lost revenue they've got to explain and, you know, set out a policy for, or they didn't mean it, in which case it was a screw-up. And in either of those scenarios, what the public are hearing right now is a vast, unfunded tax cut, which, for the public, reminds them of that Liz Trust budget. And the thing that really strikes me is, why? Why are they doing this? Why are they getting themselves into this mess? And the only reason that I can think of is the Conservative backbenchers. In the end, what they're doing is throwing red meat to the backbenchers because Rishi Sunak is in office but not in power, and that's bad for the country. But let's remind ourselves, this is a party that has been in power for 14... This is almost like they're the challenger party. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Ted us in and we will scrap national shops. If they've been this motivated, why are they leaving it until the 11th hour to actually talk about I mean, it, noting that they did put one cut in at the uh, last autumn statement? If they're talking about merging, National insurance and income tax. And again, I feel like I'm slightly scrubbing in the dark now because I don't actually know what don't worry, they don't the policy either, right? is. They, I, I don't, don't know. Either, Sophie, I wouldn't worry. There is an argument that's quite a sensible thing to do, right? I mean, look, it's very difficult. I know that previous chancellors have looked at it before and it's a really thorny issue. But it, there is an argument that that would be a good simplification of the tax system, right? If you're going to even talk in public about something like that as the government, you've got to explain how you're going to pay for it, the time scale over which you're going to do it, why you want to do it and how you want to do it. And they've done none of those things. And I think without any of those things, it either ends up looking like a cock-up or the, a, a mad pledge that they've not really thought about and slipped out at the end of a budget. And again, in either of those scenarios, people who are really feeling the pinch, you know, whose household incomes have been going down over the course of this parliament, who can't afford to do their annual family holiday, they're going to be listening to this and thinking, do these people really have a plan yeah. for my economy to put money in my pockets? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've been covering the budget over the last few days, haven't you? What's your kind of overriding impression? Um, it was flat. It was not what you'd expect from a party that's trailing 20-plus points behind. Having said that, I don't think Mr Hunt had much to play with. I think we had to afford a degree of sympathy. But if you want to go to how my listeners reacted, who are, of course, the voters, uh, it was a very, very slim pickings. They were not impressed. Interesting. Uh, we're going to have much more from you uh, later on, not least uh, on the timing uh, of the election. So we'll come back to that later. And, of course, ongoing reaction to the budget is sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the former Conservative Special Advisor Sam Shah. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up praise for our voters panel in Parliament. We're going to bring you that and also get their verdict on the Chancellor's plans. I'm Greg Milam and I'm Sky's Chief North of England Correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news.
when you cover big, tense protests, there's almost always a moment when the atmosphere changes, there's a different noise, and you start to smell tear gas in the air. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt. It can be incredibly surreal being swept up in their world, but we try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. When we spoke to the fishermen down in Cornwall, all the politics from Westminster was a million miles away. This was about their jobs, their livelihoods. Welcome back. Let's turn now to the desperate situation facing those in Gaza and new developments this evening coming through as we learn that the US President Joe Biden will announce plans for a temporary port on the Strip's coast to get more humanitarian aid in. Our US correspondent Mark Stone is in Washington. Mark, what can you tell us? Yeah, well, uh, on the face of it, the White House are describing this as a port. But then when you read further on uh, and listen to what their officials are saying, it isn't a port. It's more of a pier uh, or a, um, a causeway, as they're calling it, that they say will now be built uh, somewhere uh, along the coast of Gaza. They haven't said where um, and that it will be built in the coming days uh, and weeks. I, I think, uh, honestly, th this is a, a reflection of, of a pretty desperate policy move by the Americans, one that they didn't want to make, one that Joe Biden didn't think he'd have to make. But because of the situation on the ground, combined with the, the inability, it seems, of America to be able to, to pressure Israel to open more land borders, they have felt that they have to make this decision. It follows a decision last week to, to organize airdrops, American airdrops from the sky of aid. That itself is not very uh, accurate. It is dangerous. Uh, now this, this maritime bridge, which will effectively link with ships um, at Cyprus, 200 miles to the northeast, uh, northwest of, of Gaza, uh, with Gaza itself, it will allow aid to get in. But, but, you know, it raises more questions than it does answers. First of all, how long will this take? No answer for that except saying a, a few weeks. Uh, who will um, manage the aid once it's off the ships on the ground? The Americans say there will be no American troops on the ground, but you can imagine there will obviously be stampedes. There will be thousands of people trying to get to this aid as it's offloaded. How will it be offloaded if American troops are not on the ground? How will it be built if American troops are not on the ground? Many, many unanswered questions uh, in a, an announcement that Joe Biden will make tonight at his State of the Union address. And that's something else, too. There's politics involved here. His State of the Union address uh, is a, an absolutely pivotal moment for him, described even by his own side as a reset moment as he casts himself uh, ahead of the general, uh, the presidential election. And Gar Gaza is a key problem there too for him. And so uh, there's politics at play, um, but this is, yes, it's good news uh, in a humanitarian sense, uh, but it's, it's a long way off and it's a pretty desperate measure. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Mark Stone there for us in Washington. Well, the reaction we gathered to the budget with our voters panel of people who backed the Conservatives in the 2019 general election was raised in the House of Commons earlier. Here is how Labour's shadow leader of the House, Lucy Powell, brought it up. The Sky News panel of 2019 Tory voters couldn't be more damning. Absolutely farcical, said one. They've got no plan, said another, who thought the budget was a great vote loser. A waste of time, and it's time for them to go, said a third. And that's because, on the big issues, this budget changes nothing. Well, here's our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, with a more in-depth look now on what they made of the budget. These are the voters who will decide the next election. An online panel who all voted Tory in 2019, now deciding again. They are the target audience for all of this. Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. This was one of the last chances for the government to win back their support. It's they may not have done enough. Very, very small plaster on a very big gaping hole. I think people can see straight through it. 
not the only ones left wanting a lot more. Sorry, that was absolutely farcical. It will have absolutely no impact on me whatsoever. Waste of time. Unhelpful. <sighs> time for them to go. They weren't all quite so harsh. I thought it was a fair budget. The cut to the national insurance by 2p was good. But Rishi Sunak needs to win back all of this group. And asked to rate the budget, only 17 gave it a positive score. 25 were negative or neutral. The focus on tax cuts at the budget was all designed to target these people. Voters who backed the Conservatives in 2019 and now Rishi Sunak desperately needs for an election. But they're telling us it's not enough. And some of them have been damning. We asked our panel to sum up the budget in a word. The most popular, disappointing. Two said hopeful. The rest were largely negative, with words like unconvincing and lacklustre. And three in every five of these key voters said it had made them less likely to vote Conservative. A great vote loser, I'm afraid. I cannot see this doing anything to persuade people to vote Conservative at a future election. It's just not bold enough. It doesn't... It tries to do something, but it's just too... It's too prudent. It certainly won't help the cause. I think potentially they've... Uh played into the hands of Keir Starmer there, really, because they haven't been bold enough. Um, Voters like these already seem to be moving away from the Conservative Party. Rishi Sunak doesn't have many chances left to stop them switching off entirely. Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, let's talk again uh, to Nick and Josh, uh, shall we? Pretty damning. Um, and, of course, off the back of a budget that there has been some criticism of. I mean, Josh, whenever I speak to people from the Labour Party, they still say, yeah, it's going to be May, 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 May. The election's going to be in May. It's not going to be in May, is it? Well, if I knew the answer to that, I could, I'd have to read Rishi Sunak's mind. I don't know. I don't think he actually knows when the election is going to be. I think it's less likely after this budget, which I just don't think will have moved the dial at all. I think, as you saw from those voters, the, the really big picture is that fiscal events like this, actually, when you zoom out, given how bleak things are, it's very difficult for them to make a meaningful difference to the incomes of ordinary people. And we're still, you know, sort of stuttering towards the end of a parliament in which, for the first time in modern history, the British people will be worse off at the end of it than they were at the start of it. And that's a pretty extraordinary thing. And you would expect, in that context, the Prime Minister to do everything he possibly can to make sure that that needle moves before he goes to the polls. What we need is a giant egg timer to turn it over, <laughs> right? Because if I've got my sums right, if they want to go in May, they've got about three weeks, roughly, yeah. three weeks to get the business done. Right. We are no closer to getting a plane off to Rwanda now than we were all those months ago. The only people who've gone to Rwanda are the King and Suella Bravman. Fortunately, one came back, and unfortunately, the other one did too. We haven't sent anybody there who needs to go there. This is their great flagship policy. They will play for time. This will be Fergie time, as if they were Manchester United. <laughs> they will add as many minutes on the clock as they possibly can, because they've got to get someone on a plane to Rwanda. I don't see it till October or November. I mean, I mostly buy that. The, my only caveat is Nick. Mostly buy that. What's the matter, Josh? Yeah, Come on, so, so his, say I agree with his, Nick. That I agree with Nick political. almost with entirely Nick. with one caveat, which is, if I am Rishi Sunak, ever since I became Prime Minister, I've never really had control over the public argument, over the story, yeah. over what, what story I'm telling about myself and my country. His one remaining opportunity to do that is to say, you know what, I'm going to go early despite the story against me. And then, you know, that would That's reset not a great story, is it? It's, to be honest, it's, not, it's not an election-winning story. I managed it it, it says I'm ready, I'm ready to, you know, meet the people, make my argument, mm. prosecute it in public. And if he doesn't do that, the risk is that he just keeps stuttering along, you know, the backbenchers keep dividing the Conservative Party, Rwanda gets further thwarted by that, and actually I'm not sure that looks any better than, than going early. Interesting. We'll see. We will see. We will yeah. see. Well, we'll see in three weeks, as you said, probably. Yeah, that's yeah. all they've got. For going May 26th. Yeah. March 26th. Uh, March right, 26. I'm being told right. that we do have to wrap this chat up now. Oh, right. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, coming up next on the Politics Hub. Mentors, friends and words of advice for the wife of the man eyeing down the streets. I catch up with Cherie Blair about her work ahead of International Women's Day.
welcome back. Now, ahead of International Women's Day tomorrow, I've sat down with Sheree Blair. Her foundation, which helps women entrepreneurs in low- and middle-income countries, has a new report out about the challenges and opportunities they face from technology. I also spoke to her about the possibility of a Labour leader going to live in Number 10 Downing Street and whether she had any advice for his wife. Thanks so much for being on the programme. It's great to speak to you. Uh, now, you've done a report into women and work. It's to mark International Women's Day. Do we need an International Women's Day, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I'm afraid there's nowhere in the world where 50% of the world's population, the female part, has equal opportunities to men, whether it's in business, in politics, uh, or in basic things like education and health. Mm. And so when, when you get that issue, then we, every day we should be thinking about how do we level up the playing field for women. And just talk me through what it is you've been looking at in this report specifically. Well, uh, together with Intuit, my foundation, we work with women in low and middle income countries, women entrepreneurs. And so we wanted to look at women, business and technology. Mm. What impact are women using technology? What impact is that technology having on their business? And this report, for the first time, actually we asked about AI as well, mm. because this is the, the trendy thing, this is a transformational thing. Are women getting their share of the opportunities or are, are they getting more of their fair share of the dangers? Mm. And what did you find then when it comes to AI? Well, when it comes to, well, when it comes to technology in general, but the women we surveyed, and that was one... 1,150-odd in 81 different countries, they were tech-savvy. 92% of them mm. use smartphones. Mm. And now that's partly because of we work using technology, but that's mm. a huge percentage. And half of that, 44% of them, were actually already using, in some way or another, AI. Mm. Um, but they all said to us, you know, we don't feel we know how best to use it. We, we, we would welcome opportunities to learn how better to use it in our business. And they also told us, 76% said they had encountered uh, gender-based violence in some of the uses that they have had in uh, using AI yeah. and using technology and 44% of them said it had had an impact on their business and 9% said it had actually significantly impacted on their business. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it feels like, you know, women have always experienced sexism and misogyny. Of course, it's just going to continue, isn't it, through technology. It's, it's the person using the phone on the other end, isn't it? Do you think that, I guess the companies themselves, you know, the tech companies, the social media companies, need to do more to step up? Well, I think two things. One, I don't accept that, oh, well, women have always faced misogyny, that we should say, well, that's just what we've got to, we have got to deal with it. We have to change society so it's unacceptable. I also think that uh, with technology, what, what's put in is also what you get out. Mm. When you think, if you look at the technology industry in general, only 25% Mm -hmm. less than 25% are actually females employed in that industry. Mm. Uh, so you have an overwhelming male-based um, mm. data set, data mindset, uh, and therefore you're seeing that reflected mm. in, 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 what's, in what's coming out. Mm. I mean, we've seen it quite a lot in Parliament as yes, well. We, you know, we, we talked a lot on this programme about the threats that MPs have faced. Um, some MPs even saying that they, they've quit because they, you know, they don't want the threats to themselves, to their families. Is this something that concerns you? Of course, it, it must concern everybody. That when people, I mean, obviously our representatives going about their business, being receiving threats is bad. But you know, everybody, mm. you know, a woman entrepreneur doing her business, on what basis is it right to then use that as an opportunity to send obscene or threatening messages or? stalk somebody like that. It, it, it isn't acceptable. You started the interview talking about how you know, we don't have equality anywhere mm. across the world. And look, you know, we've had a lot of uh, female leaders recently, and whether it's New Zealand, Germany, here in the UK as well. But I guess it feels like we're almost seeing the kind of reversion to the strong man at the minute, globally. You know, Trump, Putin, President Xi. Is this a concern? Is this, do you feel like the world's becoming almost a more macho place? Well, I think part there is a there is definitely that tendency, but I also think people 
value collaborative leadership. Mm. Um, you know, we've seen many... You mentioned the women leaders. Not enough, yes. but this idea that collaborative workspaces, working together, a leadership which isn't just my way or the highway, but which actually tries to listen to everybody, mm. does seem to, to produce results. Mm. And uh, so I think people are also looking for that. Mm. I think what they are also looking for, and this is one of the things we do in our foundation, is networks and support mm. groups. Mm. And that's another great positive about the internet, because uh, as well as face-to-face, -face, mm. you can also set up networks and mentoring. We have a, a global mentoring platform uh, that my foundation runs, which matches men and women mentors all over the world with our women entrepreneurs in over 100 different countries. It's interesting yeah. to talk about mentors. I definitely feel that I've had, you know, some really valuable kind of mentorships over my own career as well, particularly among women as well. Is there a, do you have a particular mentor yourself that you look back on and think, oh, I, she's really helped me out, she made a big difference to me? Well, the interesting thing, and you all have found this as well, that your mentors don't have to necessarily be of the same sex. That's true, it's a good point, yeah. And um, certainly when I started my legal career, only 10% of, of mm. women at the, at the bar were women. Mm. So, you know, the opportunities for me being mentored by a woman, now it's more like 40% so is mm. different. So, People who are your mentors, your sponsors, they always matter. In my case, um, I, was, I was very lucky with some of the uh, senior barristers I worked with. Derry Irvin was a big supporter of mine, uh, mm. Michael Beloff. Uh, and then, of course, when my husband became leader of the opposition and mm. I got to know very well... Hillary Clinton's still a mm. dear friend, and she quite was quite a cool mentor, I have to say. She I'm not sure my mind cool. really matches that, sadly. <laughs> she, is, she is, is a cool mentor, but it's also... Sometimes you can also learn from people mm. the reverse way. Mm. Uh, and I still learn a lot for, for, the, for the young women in mm. my foundation and the, and the young men and women in my law firm. We... Now, looking at the UK, it looks... Pretty likely we might have a uh, Labour Prime Minister. I know you're not going to want to comment uh, <laughs> on British politics, but would you have any advice for, you know, his wife? I'm sure she's going to get uh, plenty of advice, but uh, I will always... I will tell her what Hillary Clinton said to me, which is you're always going to face criticism. <laughs> Some people will dislike you, not for anything you do, but because of what you mm. represent. And therefore, the most important thing is to be true to yourself and do mm -hmm. the things that you feel comfortable about doing. That's great advice. It really is from a great mentor. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Really good to talk to you. Lovely to see you two again. Thank you. <laughs> great advice uh, to whoever the next PM's wife is, but probably great advice to uh, everyone, or all of us as well, actually. Still to come. The worlds of pop and politics collide. We'll discuss the stars seeking seats in Westminster and ask if a new band could form in Parliament. Coming up on the UK tonight at 8 o'clock, a mother denies causing the death of her newborn baby. Find out what Constance Martin had to say as she gave evidence in her defence today. And as Red Bull suspends the woman who made allegations against Christian Horner, he tells a news conference it's time to move on from the scandal. That and much more coming up on the UK Tonight at 8. Yes, yeah, so coral bleaching is when the coral itself um, becomes stressed due to changes in environmental conditions. So in this case, and normally due to an increase in sea surface temperature. And this coral becomes stressed and it loses... Uh, what's called its zooanthanelli, which are small algae cells which live within the coral itself. And those algae provide the coral with the majority of their energy. So when the coral becomes stressed and it expels these algae, it basically begins to starve. Um, and these algae give the coral their colour as well. They're very colourful. So that's why we call it bleaching, because when they go, the coral then becomes pale and you have this very ghostly looking reef, which is completely, completely pale in comparison to its normal colourful self. So corals can recover from this, um, but it does depend how long the temperature stays high and how high that temperature goes. Unfortunately, it looks like we are entering a fourth mass coral bleaching event. Um, 
This has already begun to happen in the Southern Hemisphere uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, for instance. It looks like it could span the entirety of the Southern Hemisphere this time. Um, unfortunately, last time on the third mass coral bleaching event, which was in 2014 to 2017, we saw sort of 50% uh, mortality on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, in one of the places I work in the Indian Ocean, the Chagos Archipelago, we saw about two thirds um, of the reef suffer mortality. And this event, unfortunately, is looking even worse. Coral reefs are amazing. They support about 25% of marine life and uh, they support within that many fish species, which are really important for fisheries, both, both for local communities and for commercial fisheries. So many uh, commercial fish species which live in the open ocean will actually spend their juvenile years on coral reefs before migrating out to sea. Um, so they're very important for, for fisheries, which bring in billions of dollars a year, not to mention supporting the livelihoods of many uh, small uh, rural um, poor communities. Hello, welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now, there's a fresh episode of a new podcast, Electoral Dysfunction, available from tomorrow. Each week, Beth Rigby, Jess Phillips and Ruth Davidson unravel the spin in politics. And this week, they're asking why our MPs aren't talking more about our cash-strapped councils. Here's a little taste. Local government is actually the bit of politics that people actually interact with. That's your libraries, your, your, your streetlights, your, your, your road surfaces, your potholes. That's actually, you'd be surprised how much people care much more about that stuff than they care about anything that we oh, talk about in Westminster. I can't believe that the largest local authority in the whole of Europe going bust wasn't actually a bigger story, story in all of this. Nearly one in five council leaders say uh, they're likely to declare bankruptcy in the next 15 months. And I just was thinking about this thing whereby in Westminster, people who are in positions of, of national power and influence, um, they don't really want to talk about all of this, do they? Uh, so, yeah, that's up now wherever you get your podcast. Now, what do these two bands have in common? Oh, it's like a flashback to my youth there. Now, both Blur and Gomez have bandmates standing as Labour candidates in the upcoming election. I know the allure of politics, surely enough to tempt any <clears throat> pop star. But could we now see a new parliamentary band made up of MPs, the likes of which we've seen just once before? Back in the mid-2000s, a few cross-party rockers formed the band MP4, and three of the members are still in Parliament. Right, let's don't bring in Nick and Josh. Could be a better parliamentary band than ever. Well, it's an interesting idea. I just <laughs> wonder. Uh, I, I wonder who we um, who could we have? I suppose we could have um, uh, Pretty Woman Patel or a Theresa Maggie May. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to think of the sort of people who uh, who who else there might be out there. But I, I don't know whether they'd hit the right note. We'd mm. have to see. Blair and Gomez. This is a serious, uh, you know. Serious proposition here. I mean, it is. The main thing is they've got to win first. Yeah, and that's fair. Yeah. I can't remember. I think Dave Royal, Dave Rantry's in uh, Mid Sussex. Uh, and, yeah, uh, he is Mid Sussex. Mid Sussex. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if he wins, if he un if he becomes an MP on election night, one thing we know for sure is Keir Starmer is about to get the keys to Number Ten Downing Street. Mm. And then the other one is Brighton, which is of course uh, it's a tricky one for Labour as well, isn't mm. it? So. Isn't that where Eddie Izzard? It was. He so Eddie the, in selection. he beat yeah. Eddie Izzard. This go the Gomez guitarist. OK, so yeah. there must be something about because that you'd have thought a high-profile candidate like that, they'd have a damn good chance, mm. you, um, you would have thought. Either of you, um, any musical leanings? I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I'm pretty prolific on the drums. Oh, so you actually? Get, well, I'm OK. I can get by. Oh, I didn't know that. That's very good. <laughs> I can get by. You get called up to the parliamentary band. No, I absolutely yeah, would wow. not get called up to the But what about you? What can you play? No, not really, I'll oh, be honest. Oh, come on, you must be able to. Oh, my what about the triangle? 
Yeah, I could do the triangle. <laughs> what can we get you on? The maracas. Xylophone, I'm OK at the xylophone. <laughs> yeah, well, there we go, perfect. There go. Yeah, exactly, a percussion band. <laughs> there you go. I'm sure you'd love to watch it. Yeah. Politics Hub special. Uh, that is it from us tonight. They've I'll see you. have <laughs> suffered enough. Yeah, I'm not going to get the triangle on. <laughs> Next up is the UK Tonight.